good morning, the congregations of Philadelphia, Taylor, and Unity United Methodist Churches. Thank you for welcoming them into your home today. Good morning and welcome once again to worship with Unity, Taylor, and Philadelphia United Methodist Churches. It's so wonderful to be with you here again after being off for a week and having a wonderful time. But uh, I'm also excited to be back with you. So let's join our hearts together and prepare to worship and go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you today thankful for the opportunity to come into your presence, to worship you, to sing praises, to hear your scripture proclaimed. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence and thank you for being with us, Lord, and through all things. We come before you today, Lord, and we give thanks for the many blessings that have abounded since last we were together. Thank you for family, for friends, for our churches, for our country. And Lord, we pause now to acknowledge that there are those who don't know you, and we pray that you will send someone to minister to them, Lord, and to show them your love, your kindness and help them see the way to their salvation. We pause now and lift up those friends, family, acquaintances, now, Lord, who need your healing touch, whether that be physically, spiritually, financially, Lord, those who are going through storms in their lives. We all know someone, and so we pause now to lift up their names to you. We pause for a moment, Lord, to single out some of those blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Fun times with family, friends, associates. Lord, we lift up and ask you to heal our country, heal its citizens and Remind its leaders that they are there to serve, not to be served. And Lord, this is for all elected officials and those who are appointed also from the lowest local levels to the highest national and international levels. And we come before you, Lord, and we pray the model prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's scripture is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Fill each of us with your Holy Spirit and may only your words be lifted up and heard this morning. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. You know, you can take the most wonderful day and everything be going along just right, just the way you planned, and just in a moment's notice, it can just be blown to smithereens. Well, that's kind of what happened to us when we began our vacation a week ago last Tuesday and we had boarded our flight to go to Portland. And we were on the plane, everybody was settled, and the pilot there in Little Rock came on the speaker and said, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but the computers have gone down and we will not be able to leave just yet. Well, just yet meant approximately two hours of sitting in the plane until we were finally able to take off to Denver. And when we arrived in Denver, we found out that we were either sixth or eighth in line for a gate. Because you see, that computer crash had been nationwide. Y'all knew that before we did. But it walked out, it just completely crashed Southwest, Southwest computers. And when we arrived in Denver, we spent 45 minutes waiting to get to a gate and when we got there and deplaned there were we learned that there had been a hundred and fifty flights southwest flights all backed up in that airport so we were in the middle of flights that had been canceled delayed and and workers uh, feverishly trying to find people their next ride to their destination. Well, we finally, four hours later, boarded our flight to Portland and arrived in uh, Portland six hours late. Well, was this storm that in that came into my life that day the airline's fault? Probably not. With with all the hacking and things that have been going on lately, there is probably not much telling what went down. But you know what? It was a storm. And nothing could have prevented it. Storms come, stuff happens. It's a fact of life. Storms came in Jesus' life too. And that wasn't anything unusual on the Sea of Galilee. Here he and his disciples were in a storm on the lake. You see, the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl. And the lake is there at the bottom and surrounded it, surrounding it are mountains. So the cold air from the mountains rushes down to the warm air of the lake. And when that happens, storms can't be forecast. They can only be experienced in the moment. And when this happened, 
that particular evening, the disciples were terrified and unprepared. So this story in our scripture today tells, tells me four things about storms that come in our lives. It tells me that these storms are going to come, that Jesus is with us through the storms, Jesus will calm them, and that through the storms we learn better and come to a better understanding of who Jesus is. Well, let's talk first about how storms will come. In Hebrews, there is a passage about Abraham and the promises that God made to him. You know, he really wanted a son. He wanted an heir. But in Hebrews, it tells us, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Well, that, um, where it says that he waited patiently is a little bit of a mistranslation. There, uh, more accurate translation says that Abraham waited in long-suffering. You see, Abraham didn't get his promise right away. He had to suffer life. He had to endure life before he received his promises. Life is that way. Endurance and faith, which are possible because of God's promises and God's faithfulness, are the keys to the long-suffering part. The Bible tells us this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. There are many people around us with storms raging in their lives. For some, it might be financial, it could be health, it could be someone trying to get their own life or that of a friend or, or loved one, get their life back in order. Or it could be a troubled relationship. You know, you might be a good person and you do the right things, but you still have storms that rage in your life. And at these times, you often feel like those disciples did and say, Jesus, don't you even care if I drown? Are you aware of what I'm going through? Well, when Matthew and Luke tell this story, they kind of soft-soap that part. They leave out the whether or not Jesus cares about the situation. They simply say, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Well, maybe Matthew and Luke thought that the actual words that the disciples used there were inappropriate and they made it a little softer. So how could they speak harshly to Jesus? They could because he was their friend and those were their true feelings. They were frightened, and they couldn't understand why or how this was happening. A storm in your life, in my life, doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God is angry at us or that he's paying us back for something. God isn't messing with you. Sometimes we make our own storms. And then again, sometimes... Storms just happen because that's the way life is. Trying to analyze it or assign blame is useless. We live in a fallen world. And Jesus said, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous good and bad. It happens to all of us. And we must be prepared for those storms and for those blessings. There was a TV crew in Florida after uh, Hurricane Andrew, and they were filming the destruction in this neighborhood, and they panned across, and they saw this one man standing there cleaning up in his yard, and it was the only house standing, and so this they went up to him, and the reporter said, Sir, why is it that your house is the only house standing? And the man replied, Well, I built this house myself according to the Florida State Building Code. 
when it called for two by two by six roof trusses, I used two by six trusses. I was told that a house built to code would withstand a hurricane. I did, and it did. Maybe these other houses weren't built to code. He understood that storms would come. When he moved to Florida, he knew that he stood the chance of having to live through a hurricane. It had nothing to do with him. It had to do with where he lived and the nature of the storms. His job was to be prepared. So when the sun was shining and the sky was blue and everybody else was out skiing and having a good time, it may have seen, seemed foolish to go to the extra trouble and the extra expense to meet all the codes in building his house. But when the hurricane came, it was anything but foolish. It was wisdom. And we can't understand the whys of all of our problems, but we can be like the man in Florida, and we can do our best to be prepared. So it's good to know that Jesus is going to be with us in the storm. So if I'm in a storm, I want Jesus in my boat. Jesus could have stayed on the storm that uh, on the shore that day and let the disciples just float on off, but he didn't. Where they went, he went. But the problem for the disciples that evening wasn't that Jesus was in the boat. The problem was that Jesus was asleep. How could he possibly sleep through this? Well, first, he was probably totally exhausted from ministering to the crowds. But the second thing and the most important thing was that he was at total peace. He knew who he was and he knew who his father was. He knew who he was and he knew who his father was. Whose he was, who he was, and whose he was. But they took this as a lack of caring. It's interesting that this is the only place in the Bible where we're told that Jesus slept, even though we know he had to do it because he was fully human as well as divine. He obviously had to sleep. It's ironic, though, that in this time where most human beings would find it impossible to sleep, Jesus is getting the rest of his life. He is just napping away. And the disciples were amazed that he could sleep at a time like that. Well, we've all been there. We've all been in the middle of a crisis, and it seems like God's taking a nap, that he doesn't really seem to care about what's going on with us. And we find ourselves in the same boat as the disciples. But what is Jesus' response when the disciples wake him up? Well, first of all, he re rebukes the storm. Peace, be still. But then he rebukes his disciples and says, Why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, fear and faith are incompa incompatible, and that's what Jesus wants them to know. He was, un under, he was hoping that with all they had seen and witnessed and done with him, that they would have an understanding and their faith would be strong enough. But no. So first Jesus calmed the storm, and then he had to calm his disciples. The past faithfulness of Jesus, of God, had not strengthened their future faith. Has God done things in your past for you? Does your, do your past storms cause you to have greater faith? Does it provide the basis for a greater faith in the future? Jesus will calm the storm. At the perfect time during the perfect storm, Jesus exercises his power over the storms of life. Peace be still. God is never in a hurry. His timing is always perfect. 
He doesn't go by our time. And at just the right time, not as far as the disciples were, were concerned, of course, but at just the right time, Jesus calms the storm. God has each one of us in mind. He knows understand, and understands you and your situations. He cares for you. And his timing is perfect. The Bible says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time. And Peter wrote that God is always watching out for us. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. And so Jesus will calm the storms in our lives. But the thing, the third thing we can learn from this is that we only really come to understand George, uh, Jesus. I'm sorry, it's the fourth thing. The fourth thing that we come to learn from these storms is that because of the storms and having Jesus in our lives, in our hearts, we come to understand better who he is. One commentary explains that when Jesus asked them why they were afraid, the word that they used just meant a general fear, like being afraid of the dark or being afraid when you hear a loud clap of thunder or something like that. And, but when Jesus calms the storm, the Bible says they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The words that were used there literally mean they feared with great fear. Not the same word that was used earlier that says, Oh, we're afraid. But this was with great fear. They just thought they were afraid of the storm. But they were terrified now of Jesus. You see, as Jews, they believed that only Jehovah, God himself, could stop wind and calm the storm. So that's when they realized that they were in the boat with God himself. It's one thing to be in the boat with someone that you believe was sent from God to be a great teacher and rabbi and a spiritual leader. But it's something else to be enclosed or confined in this small boat with all of you on a, in a storm and realize that you're confined with the Lord of the universe. All that power. In your boat. So yes, they were terrified. Their knees probably buckled and they began to tremble. They would have found it hard to breathe and probably couldn't stop shaking. Just like any of us would if we found ourselves in a small boat with the Lord of the universe. This is the second time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus has rebuked something and said, be still. The first instance we talked about two or three weeks ago, when we talked about Jesus entering the synagogue and the evil spirit within the man uh, recognized him. And he, he, the evil spirit called out to Jesus, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus said, be quiet. Come out of him. And I imagine the people there responded pretty much the very same way that the disciples did in the boat. They said, even evil spirits obey his orders. Who is this man? Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey his orders. Throughout Mark's gospel, the disciples and others keep coming to new realizations and understandings of who Jesus is, and it's always in the context of some crisis. We're the same way. 
We keep meeting Jesus in new ways as we meet him in new crises. We don't really understand who he is or the power he has until we see him in action. I know someone whose car left the road one night because a log truck had um, swerved into her lane. And she said her car was headed straight for a tree to hit dead on. For some reason, she didn't. Instead, it missed the tree. I think Jesus probably met her in that crisis. And she has a larger understanding of who Jesus is today. You see, the blind man couldn't see Jesus, see who Jesus was until he was healed. The deaf man could not hear Jesus until his ears were opened. The affliction of the lame man brought Jesus to his side and he leapt and danced and wanted to follow Jesus. But he experienced Jesus in a whole new way. And then there was Thomas, who was devastated by the crucifixion of our Lord and didn't believe that he had been resurrected until he saw him and placed his finger in Jesus' hands inside. And he fell on his knees and he cried, My Lord and my God. In those crisis moments, we really understand who Jesus is. When we place our complete faith and trust in Jesus, we have a greater understanding of Him, a deeper relationship with Him, and a new love for Him when the storm is over. When we can see His power over darkness and the depth of His love for us, mm, it's just awe-inspiring. Jesus tells us to live by faith, not by fear. Robert Morgan tells a story about that took place in Belfast uh, where the Titanic was built. and it, This was on the Sunday after the ship sank. The townspeople were devastated, and, and Morgan told about one church that had lost 16 men to the icy waters. All were mechanics on the Titanic. And on that dark Sunday morning, that pastor read the same scripture that we read this morning. Mark 4, 35 through 41. And he told his, ch his church that there was truly only one vessel in all of history that had ever been unsinkable. And that was that little ship that held our sleeping Savior inside. And the preacher added, the only hearts that can weather the storms are hearts with Jesus inside. So all of us are familiar with storms of life, and in that thought, we can all relate to this passage this morning. We can't predict, avoid, or control them. And they come even though and while we are walking in fellowship with the Lord. But like the disciples, we must learn to trust Jesus in and through our trials. And in and through our trials, we will discover more of Him and become closer to Him. May we each see our, our trials as opportunities to grow and mature in the faith instead of focusing solely on the adversity. In Jesus' name, amen.
now would you receive this benediction. Lord, give us the strength and the courage as we go forth today to meet the trials of your life, of our lives, in faith and strength in you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.